This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. This week marks two years since white supremacists and neo-Nazis descended on Charlottesville, Virginia. On the night of August 11th, 2017, hundreds of white men bearing torches marched on the University of Virginia campus, chanting, Jews will not replace us and white lives matter. On the following day, a neo-Nazi drove his car into a crowd of anti-racist protesters, killing Heather Heyer, a 32-year-old activist. Days later, President Trump claimed there were, quote, very fine people on both sides. Since Charlottesville, white supremacists have committed at least 73 murders, according to the Anti-Defamation League. Just last week, a white supremacist in El Paso, Texas, opened fire in a crowded Walmart, killing 22 people, mostly Latinos. It's been described as the deadliest attack to target Latinos in modern American history. The El Paso gunman wrote a manifesto that contained language similar to the racist rhetoric of President Trump and prominent right-wing figures, including Rush Limbaugh and Tucker Carlson. This comes as Trump is facing increasing criticism for his racist remarks. Last month, the Democratic-controlled House voted to condemn Trump's racist attack on four freshmen congresswomen of color. Congress members Ayanna Presley, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. Trump had told them to, quote, go back and help fix the totally broken and crime-infested place from which they came. Three of the four congresswomen were born in the United States. But Trump has dismissed claims he's stoking racial tension. I am the least racist person there is anywhere in the world when con men, who I've known all, you know, almost all my business life, because I had to deal with them, unfortunately, in New York. But I got along with him, Al Sharpton. Uh, now, he's a racist. Well, we're joined right now for the hour by Ibram X. Kendi, the founding director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at American University in Washington, D.C. His new book is out today, How to Be an Anti-Racist. It's his follow-up to Stamped from the Beginning, the Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, which won the 2016 National Book Award for Nonfiction. Kendi was just 34 years old at the time, the youngest winner of the National Book Award for Nonfiction. His latest piece for The Atlantic is headlined, A Lynch Mop of One, The Assault Rifle Has Enabled Racists to Act Alone. Ibram X. Kendi, welcome to Democracy Now! Congratulations on the release of your book, and happy birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, let's begin on a less happier note, which is, um, uh, what took place in El Paso, uh, what's considered one of the largest Latino slaughters in this country, in its history. Um, you've written this very interesting piece for The um, Atlantic, A Lynch Mob of One. Explain. Sure. So, the one of the worst race riots, as they were called, in, in 1919, 100 years ago, during what was known as the Red Summer, because there was this series of, of race riots. The worst potentially happened in Chicago. And the last day of that race riot in Chicago was August 3rd. Exactly, uh, uh, you know, a century later, we had what happened in, in El Paso. And those lynch mobs a century ago, they needed to have large and coordinated numbers of people in order to essentially slaughter large numbers of people of color. But today, the lynch mob only needs an assault rifle. And, and we saw that in El Paso, Texas. So what needs to be done about it? It needs to be—I think we need to, first and foremost, recognize how an assault rifle, one gun, one AR-47, one AR-15, um, could literally lead to many people dying with this combination of racist ideas. This shooter in El Paso had both. He had this assault rifle and an assault rifle of racist ideas, and we need to figure out a way to control, if not ban, both of them. And, of course, that shooter was—his uh, uh, his manifesto had eerie echoes of many of the words of, of President Trump these days about an invasion occurring of the United States. Uh, you just heard that clip that we played of uh, President Trump saying he's the least racist person anywhere in the world. Your reaction, when you hear not only that, but the number of people uh, who still support him and his views and perspectives in the country? 
Well, I would say he's probably the least anti-racist person <laughs> anywhere in the world. Uh, and, and his denial of his racism is essential to racism itself. Even the El Paso shooter, at the end of his manifesto, he, he denied his own racism. I mean, can you imagine that? Writing this manifesto, demonizing Latinx people over and over again, telling the nation that you, that they were invading and that you were protecting the nation, and then saying at the end, well, they're just gonna call me a racist, even though I'm really not. I mean, and that's why, I mean, denial itself is, is, is that heartbeat. And, and I think in contrast, an anti-racist is seeking to acknowledge and admit, which is certainly something that Trump has never done. Well, Fox News TV personality Tucker Carlson is under fire for insisting that white supremacy is a hoax and not a real problem in America. Carlson made the remarks on his program last week. The whole thing is a lie. If you were to assemble a list, a hierarchy of concerns or problems this country faces, where would white supremacy be on the list? Right up there with Russia, probably. It's actually not a real problem in America. Well, we're continuing our, our discussion with Ibra, Ibram Kendi. Your reaction to Tucker Carlson? I mean, these are some of the same types of people who say that the Holocaust was a hoax. They say that racism is a hoax. They say that slavery was good for black people. I mean, this is the ideology, right? Because when they can't deny the obvious evidence that shows that, that domestic white supremacist terrorism is on the rise, that it is the principal uh, form of domestic terror that is affecting American lives, they just deny its, ex its existence completely. And, and that's certainly what he's doing. I wanted to ask you, in your... Uh in your previous books, and your, the, you looked at the history of racist, uh, uh, of racist ideas in the United States, and one of the issues that you focused on was the, um, the development of intelligence tests and the history of intelligence tests uh, in terms of uh, being racially motivated from the very beginning. And so many uh, young, young people in the African-American Latino communities are ba basically oppressed and classified and, and cast aside as a result of their performance on various intelligence tests. Yes. Yeah, so currently, in, in most intelligence or tests, uh, Latinos and, and, and black people receive lower scores than, than whites and Asians. The question is, is what is the problem? Is there a problem with the test takers or the test? Mm -hmm. and, and for 100 years, Americans have made the case that black people, Latino people, are not achieving intellectually uh, as much as, as other people, as much as white people. And I would argue, no, the problem isn't with these test takers. The problem is with the tests themselves. These are tests that were created by eugenicists. When you look at the person who created the SAT test, when you look at the person who first popularized the IQ test in the United States, these were avowed eugenicists. Well, go into that more fully. We've got the hour here, and this is an astounding history you write about. Well, I mean, Lewis Terman, for instance, who, who wrote a century ago this book called in which he sort of sought to promote this new IQ test that he had brought over uh, from Europe. In that, in that book, he talked about that these tests will prove that black people are intellectually inferior. I mean, it, this was the hypothesis that he put forth in a book that promoted the original IQ test a century ago. And Carl Brigham, who essentially established the SAT test a decade later in the 20s, was a eugenicist from Princeton. I mean, these are eugenicists who created these tests not just to prove that Latinos and black people were inferior to white people, but also to prove that women were genetically intellectually inferior to men, that poor people were genetically intellectually inferior to wealthy people, that Southerners, I mean, everyone, that non-Anglo-Saxons were intellectually inferior to Anglo-Saxons. And, and, and so the, this test, became the evidence that they had been looking for, really, for hundreds of years, to prove that people of color and poor people and women were intellectually inferior. So explain what the College Board has recently announced, that they are adding an environmental context dashboard um, for all students taking the SATs. What does this mean? I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> uh, one thing I think many the College Board, ETS, some of these other institutions that have been under fire by 
not only anti-racist, but even parents who don't want their children being in these high-stakes testing environments. And, and I think they're figuring out new ways to essentially maintain the existence of these tests. And, and certainly, this is a way to respond to those who are fundamentally pointing to the environment as the problem and not necessarily the test takers. Well, here in New York City, uh, uh, Mayor de Blasio has been attempting to eliminate the standardized test for the most elite high schools uh, in the city, because actually the number of African Americans and Latinos admitted into this highly specialized high school has been dropping, has been increasing, even as the population has been. But he's met enormous resistance at the state level, and he has not been able to get that through. But uh, your sense of this battle that's been going on, not only in New York City, but across the country over tests? Well, I've been following that. And what I've specifically been following is those parents who, who come to town halls and argue for the maintenance of tests. Many of these parents, though certainly not all, have said things like, my kids are scoring on the test because they work hard. Those other black and Latinx kids, obviously the implication is they're not working hard. What they're not talking about, though, is that the test prep companies, the test prep tutors, the test prep industry is concentrated in New York City, in white and Asian neighborhoods. So it, it, it makes sense that those who get the best test prep and who have the most access to resources to pay for test prep are going to do the best on these tests. And very interesting, <clears throat> and probably a corollary of all that, is that the New York schools, the public schools, are the most segregated in the country. In the country. It, We're it not is... talking about the South here. We're talking <laughs> about New York. And I think that's, a that's an incredibly important point, because even when we talk about anti-racism, when, when most people think of who needs to be an anti-racist, they think of Southerners, they think of people who voted for Trump. They don't think of people who are advocating for the maintenance of these tests, which are denying access to some of the best schools in New York City to black and Latino kids. Well, this brings us to the presidential race, uh, to former vice president, 2020 presidential hopeful Joe Biden, who is coming under fire after he recently contrasted poor kids with white kids at an event hosted by the Iowa Asian and Latino Coalition. We have this notion that somehow if you're poor, you cannot do it. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids, P wealthy kids, black kids, Asian kids. Well, Biden later said he misspoke while delivering his remarks, Ibram Kendi. I mean, if he misspoke, there's a reason why he misspoke to begin with, right? He, and, and I think that this idea, right, connecting poor kids to black kids is quite widespread, just like there's an idea that connects rich kids with white kids, which not only... And so, with the first, it not only sort of recognizes that actually the majority of black people in this country are not poor, but in, in the case of connecting rich kids with white kids, you are ignoring all of these poor white kids, right, who are classified by um, white racists as white trash. That's a racialized term that imagines, right, that, that there's something wrong with poor white people, and they have less because they are less. Oh, I wanted to ask you about, uh, in your new book, uh you, you talk about uh, the whole issue of class and race and the relationship of capitalism to race. And in one section of the book, you write, uh, anti-capitalism cannot eliminate class racism without anti-racism. And case in point, you mentioned, is the persistent racism Afro-Cubans faced in socialist Cuba after the revolution of 1959. Uh, your, uh, give us a better sense of how you see this whole interrelationship between the fight against racism and also against capitalism? Well, I think it's interrelated. I mean, I, I classify racism and, and capitalism as these conjoined twins, right, from the same body, but different personalities, different faces. And the reason why I do that is because I'm an historian. And so I, 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 I track, particularly in my last book, the origins of, of racism cannot be separated from the origins of capitalism. The origins of capitalism cannot be separated from the origins of racism. The life of racism cannot be separated from the life of capitalism and vice versa. When you think about, for instance, the slave trade, which was critical in the accumulation of wealth in Europe, that was fundamentally a, ra a set of racist policies. When you think of colonialism or even slavery, these are 
a, a relation, these are fundamentally a relationship between racism and capitalism, which was essential to its emergence. And so I think in order to truly be anti-racist, you also have to truly be anti-capitalist, as I write in the book. And in order to truly be anti-capitalist, you have to be anti-racist, because they're interrelated. So talk more about this and the founding of this country and the issue of slavery, the number of presidents who had slaves and uh, um, president who had the most slaves of all, Thomas Jefferson, something like, what, 600, 600. slaves? Yeah, I mean— Lay you, that all out. When you, when you look at the, the founding of this country, you, you're, you're really talking about the power um, American power at its founding largely being held in the hands of slaveholders. You're talking about slaveholders who largely shaped economic policy, economic policy that they ensured did not eliminate or harm racial policy, which was key to, of course, their slaveholding. You're also talking about a group of people and slaveholders who by 1860, became the richest group of people in the world. And slaves and the crops that they were producing and the land that they were producing those crops on were essentially the wealth of America. These were, when you, when you talk about how America became rich, you can't separate America's riches from slavery. And the reason why America was able to become rich through slavery, which was an economic system, was because of racism. So that's why you can't really separate the two. And I know many people want to, but, I mean, we have to stare truth in the face. In uh, continuing in that vein, the, uh, for the first time, I think, in a presidential race, the issue of reparations has now been addressed by several of the Democratic candidates, whereas previously had been largely uh, an issue uh, among activists in the African-American and Latino community. I'm wondering your perspective of how this is now finally surfacing uh, and the resistance against it. Well, I think it's obviously surfacing because of those activists, right, and, and, and because of their voices and because of their activism. And I, and I would say to, to, to my fellow Americans who oppose reparations, you know, I typically, I would ask the question, currently, well, first, I'd make the statement uh, that currently the white median wealth in this country is 10 times higher than black median wealth. And then forecasters are estimating that by 2050, black median wealth will be at zero dollars. And they're forecasting that two decades later, that Latino median wealth will be at zero dollars. So what we're, what we're seeing now is a growing racial wealth gap. How do you, how do we stop this growing racial wealth gap, turn it around, even close it, without reparations? Because the reason for that racial wealth gap is because of past and present racist policies. And so reparations is not only a way to challenge and eliminate those policies, but also to essentially repair the effects of those policies, which is the racial wealth gap. Um, <clears throat> let's turn to 2020 Democratic presidential candidate Senator Cory Booker, who this is uh, Booker speaking on ABC's This Week. This impotent simplicity of who is and who isn't a racist is really not the question. If we have racism in our country and we are all in this together and we believe that injustice anywhere is threat to justice everywhere, what are you doing about that injustice? If you, it's not enough to say I'm not a racist in America. If racism exists, you need to be anti-racist. So let's go to this issue, and that's the core of your book, Ibram Kendi, How to Be an Anti-Racist, the idea that to be a non-racist and to be an anti-racist are very different. They are. And, and when we really sort of acknowledge the term not racist, we're, we're really thinking about a term that comes from the larger sentence, I'm not racist. And, and then when we think of who and when are people saying, I am not racist, they're typically saying that when what? They're being charged with being racist for something they said or did. And this is Americans across the ideological board. But the people who first and most prominently would say that they're not racist were eugenicists, right? Were Jim Crow segregationists. White nationalists and supremacists today are saying no matter what policies they support, no matter what ideas they express, 
that they are not racist. They can say that Latinx people are invading this country. They can say that this black neighborhood is an infestation. And then they can turn around and say, I'm the least racist person anywhere in the world. And, and, and what that means to me is that the term not racist, that when we say I'm not racist, that that is fundamentally a term of denial. That's all it has really ever been. It has never really had any meaning other than a way for one to deny being racist when charged with being racist. In contrast, being anti-racist, there's a clear set sense of what that is. If a racist says that certain racial groups are superior or inferior or better or worse than others, an anti-racist says there's nothing wrong or even right with any racial groups. We're equals. If a racist supports policies through their action or even inaction, as Senator Booker stated, then they're being a racist because they're allowing for the reproduction of racial inequities. If, an, if, if, if someone is supporting policies with their actions that create racial equity, they're being an anti-racist. You also delve in, in, the, in your new book on the— um how racism has affected the African-American and La Latino communities, the, the, the issue of skin color and lighter and darker. I wonder if you could talk about that as well as your own personal journey uh, through that through that maelstrom of uh, trying to understand how race works in America. Sure. So I how to be an anti-racist was very difficult for me to write because I had so many personal stories and, and one of the personal stories. Uh, and I don't want to say this, but I'm going to have to say it. It's in the book, so people are going to read it. Mm -hmm. Is when I was in college, I thought that my eyes were too dark. And so I decided to get color contacts. Mm -hmm. um, and they were these honey contacts. And my friends would joke on me that I had orange eyes. Mm -hmm. But I thought with these honey contacts that I was more beautiful, that mm -hmm. I looked better, that I was more attractive. And, and this was a representation of, of, of what I uh, sort of address in the book is known as colorism, right? This idea that the lighter the skin, the better. The lighter the eyes, the better. The straighter the hair, the better. And within communities of color, there are, of course, gradations of skin color, of, of eye color, of, of hair texture. And, and so what I did in that— And it often that, changes from generation to generation. Precisely, precisely. And, and what I did in that, in that chapter of, of called Color was sort of talk about what I called light people and dark people. And, and this is particularly within communities of color. And, and we have been led to believe, primarily taught to people of color by white people who said, since lighter people are closer to us, they're more superior to those dark people. And we've internalized those ideas. And, and there's also a set of policies that actually favor lighter people over darker people. So I talked about all of the disparities between light people and dark people. And an anti-racist does not view lighter people or even darker people as better or worse than either. Each other. Which is the perfect time to bring in um, one of the great writers of the 20th century, Toni Morrison, who we just lost last week. Last week on Democracy Now!, we did an hour, two hours, one hour on the show and one hour off with Nikki Giovanni and Angela Davis and Sonia Sanchez playing the clips of Toni Morrison. And we want to go back to one of those moments, as you describe, wanting lighter eyes, Ibram. Let's go to 2010 a conversation between Toni Morrison and Angela Davis at the New York Public Library. When I wrote the first book I wrote, The Bluest Eye, I really wanted to know why that girl felt so bad, the one who, a real-life girl, who said she wanted blue eyes. We were talking about the, whether God existed. I, of course, was persuaded that he did, and she was persuaded that he did not, and her proof was that she had prayed for blue eyes for two years. Two years? And she didn't get them, though obviously he wasn't up there. But when I looked at her and thought about how awful she would look, <laughs> if she got them. And then I thought the second thing was how beautiful she was at that moment, you know, she was just incredible. But I didn't even know whether she was beautiful or not until I thought about what she might think. Then the third thing, of course, is why does she want that? 
You know, what, what makes her think that's an improvement? And that kind of self-loathing, which is real, you know, in, when you don't have any support, made me, you know, think of that as a, as a real subject for a book. Not some old victim, but really how it works. So that's Toni Morrison. Um, there's so much to follow up on here, um, from when did you finally take off those contacts to the effect of Toni Morrison in your life. So I, I finally took them off, I believe, around the time I locked my hair, uh, when I was a, a junior in college. And I remember a few years later reading The Bluest Eye for the first time. And in, in many ways, I could not read about that little girl without thinking about myself, without thinking about that first time I put on these, these honey contacts that I thought it was an improvement, that, that I thought I was handsome, um, and how long it took me to realize that I was actually more handsome without the orange eyes, as my friends would, would, would joke on me. And, and so I think, you know, obviously Toni Morrison, like, meaning any sort of black writer living has had a tremendous um, impact on my life, um, on my personal life, let alone my sort of literary life. And, and I think one of the ways in which she had an influence, even on me writing this book, even on me writing the colorism sort of chapter, was her constant sort of instructions to black writers to not write with the right critic on our shoulders, to not write with the white gaze in our minds. Because one of the things that we have been, it's difficult for us to write about, is internalized racism. Because what we fear is going to happen is white racists are going to take that and see, we've been telling you you're the problem all along, right? And now you're finally admitting it. And, and so for me, I was like, let me get the white critic off my shoulder and write, this is a reality that, it, that people of color, particularly black people, are, are, are facing, and I wanted to speak to it. Mm. We're going to break and then come back to our discussion. We're talking to Ibram Kendi, the professor of history and international relations and founding director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at American University. Um, he is a National Book Award-winning author of Stamped from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. And just before we go to break, you were um, not a well-known professor, what, assistant professor mm -hmm. at the University of Florida. Can you describe the moment, the National Book Awards? Is this one of these, like, dinners where no one knows who gets it until you're actually your name is called? Yes, yeah. And so, um, did you have your speech all prepared? Oh, no. So, yeah, I was—I remember we had a, my wife and I, Sadiqa, we, we had a, a hotel room near the venue, and we were about to walk out, and Sadiqa was like, have you written your speech? Uh, where's your speech? And I was like, no, I didn't write that speech. I'm not going to win. <laughs> What's the purpose of, of writing a speech? And she insisted that I jot down those notes. And, and I jotted down some notes. And when I heard my name called, as the video shows, I was completely shocked. Uh, I was completely shocked and literally had to gather myself even before I spoke. Our guest for the hour, Ibram X. Kendi, professor of history and international relations, founding director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center, American University, National Book Award-winning author of Stamp from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, his book out today on his birthday, How to Be an Anti-Racist. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, I wanted to... Um... Uh, to, to go on to the, uh, the the whole issue of your your journey, your, uh, you you started out you wanted to be a sports reporter, <laughs> and uh, then you went to Temple University. And what, talk about that? You actually lived. You say in your book in Hunting Park, a neighborhood that I know well. I used to mm -hmm. live in Hunting Park and yes. ate the Luzerne, so I knew oh, that wow. area well for yeah. many years. Talk about that journey away from sports writing to becoming a historian. And a... Well, so I grew up playing basketball. I was a huge John Starks fan and, and New York Knicks fan, and, you know, I wanted to, to play in the NBA. Ironically, I joined another NBA, but... Um, and ultimately, I realized I probably wasn't good enough <laughs> to make the NBA, so I decided to, to pursue sports writing. And I... But, the, 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 but I went to sort of... I went to school in Tallahassee at Florida a and University. I was a freshman in the year 2000. When, and we all know what happened in, the, in 2000 with the election. And I was told constantly, and I talk about this in How to Be an Anti-Racist, you know, after the election of, of 2000 and so many black people's votes were, 
were suppressed or, or thrown out. I heard many of those stories firsthand, um, and it and it really sort of provided my first major lesson on racism. And and I think the more I witnessed those lessons, the more I realized that I wanted to become a reporter, sort of sharing those lessons with the world. And so I decided to go to Temple to pursue my master's. But then again, part of me was also thinking about pursuing my, 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 my doctorate to become a professor, because I, on some level, recognized that professors had more autonomy mm -hmm. <laughs> and more freedom to really write um, and research. Um, and, but when I got there, once I arrived at Temple University, uh, once I saw the life of a professor through um, the life of Malefe Asante, through the life of my dissertation advisor, Ama Mazama, the way in which they were engaged in worldwide intellectual struggle against white supremacy, uh, against racism, I was sort of hooked, and I wanted to be like them, and I wanted to be a professor. You ask the question, what if we treated racism in the way we treat cancer? Yeah, so I, while I was writing this book, um, I had stage four colon cancer. And a few years before I had cancer, my, my wife and mother had cancer. And a decade ago, my father uh, had, had cancer. And so I've, in a way, lived with cancer for, for quite some time. But more importantly, I've seen how cancer has been treated, how doctors treat cancer, um, how they save people like me who have metastatic cancer. And, and the way that they tend to do it is they first do, or they do a local treatment in which they go in and surgically remove the tumors, um, which is essentially like us going in to surgically remove racist policies in this country. Uh, but then they don't stop there, right? They also flood the body with chemotherapy to ensure that there's no more cancer cells left to ensure the cancer won't come back or to try to make sure or try to help or prevent the cancer, I should say, from coming back, which is equivalent to us flooding the body of America with anti-racist policies. But then they don't stop there, right? Once they have removed the tumors, once they've flooded the body with anti-racist policies, then they, what do they do? They watch the body very closely to make sure nothing comes back. And then if something does come back, what do they do? They treat, and treat very aggressively and quickly. So, I, you know, I wanted to sort of speak to that and, and how to be an anti-racist. What if we treated racism, which is literally a metastatic cancer that has been ravaging the American body from the beginning, in the way we treat cancer? So, lay it out for us. What would that look like? I think that would look like, first and foremost, us saving America. And, and I think we can't just talk about racism as an original sin. We, we have to talk about racism as the original cancer, as this original disease that has been killing America. It, it, it almost prevented Americans from, from, from coming together and, 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 and forming a union in, 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 at its founding. It almost killed America in the Civil War. We're literally been in a Civil War. And, and what, I, what I mean by sort of anti-racist policies is, is policies like, for instance, Medicare for all, or health, high quality health care for all, that reduce racial inequities. You know, policies like um, legalizing marijuana, policies that aggressively go after climate change, which is specifically uh, harming the communities of color. I mean, what policies do we have currently that literally have a chance to radically reduce racial inequities? Those are the types of policies we should flood the American body with. Uh, in your book, you have chapters on um, gender and sexuality. You talk about queer racism and gender racism. Could you explain? Sure. So when we think of racism and, and when we think of racial inequity and when we even think of the races, we should recognize that, so for instance, black people are not a monolith, just like Latino people are not a monolith, white people are not a monolith. Black people are literally a collection of racialized groups. And so, to give an example, black men and black women are racialized groups. And each of these groups have been targeted and denigrated with racist ideas. And as a black male, I had to come to grips with the fact that I had consumed and internalized anti-racist ideas about black women, that I was saying some of the same ideas that white men and others were saying about black women. And, 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 and I'm sure 
I was saying also some of the same ideas that white people or white heterosexuals um, were saying about the black queer community, right? Because black queers, black gays, black lesbians, black transgender women, these are racialized groups that are distinct from black heterosexuals. And black heterosexuals imagine themselves as less sexual, right, than the black queer community, which is a racist idea. You know, just at the beginning of the show, um, when um, I was presenting headlines, one of them was that the estate of Leilene Polenko, a transgender woman who was found dead in a jail cell at Rikers Island, um, <clears throat> has sued the city of New York over her death, the medical examiner saying the 27-year-old Afro-Latinx woman died of complications from epilepsy. Polenko's mother says officials knew of her medical condition, but still put her in solitary confinement without proper supervision. The alleging that this violated the 14th Amendment, as well as the Americans with Disabilities Act. Leilene was arrested in April on misdemeanor charges and jailed for two months after she was unable to post $500 bail. She really is a picture at every level of racism in America and this issue of um, uh, queer, um, racism, et cetera. She was the center of that. And you talk about mass incarceration and mm -hmm. as one of the ways that if you're going to deal with anti-racism in this country. Yeah, so, you know, black queer community, they're more likely to be poor than, than black heterosexuals, let alone white queer community. They, as some of them, are subjected to this type of violence from the state. But then most, most obviously, black transgender women are literally experiencing a genocide. I mean, I don't know of any way to talk about the fact that their average life expectancy currently is in the mid-30s. This isn't—this isn't 1750. This is 2019, and we have a group of Americans whose life expectancy is in the mid-30s. And part of the reason why is because people of color, black people, white people, Americans do not value their life view them in the way in which, and, and, and we view them in the way Trump views Latinx immigrants. And we cr criticize Trump without criticizing our views about these black transgender women. All of these people, their lives matter, and we need to recognize the ways in which they're being subjected as a result of their gender, as a result of their sexual orientation, as a result of their transgender status, as a result of their race, as a result of their class, how that's all intersecting to lead to their genocide. Ibram, you have a child? Yes. <laughs> What's her name? So, um, Imani. Uh, her name is Imani, She's, uh, which, of course, means faith. In, in Swahili, and she certainly gives me faith every day to, to challenge white supremacy and, and racism. And how old is she? She's three years old. How do you raise her as an anti-racist human being in this country? So I think, first and foremost, I think when we think about raising children, we should not be raising children to not be something, right, to not be racist. We should be raising children to be something, to be anti-racist. And, and, you know, what we're seeking to do is, is, is get her to see difference and appreciate it, right, to appreciate difference, no matter that difference is, is cultural, racial, gendered, to see difference and, and appreciate it. Uh, we're, we're also getting her to ask why. Now she's asking too many whys <laughs> about everything, but that is the central question. Why does this exist? And, and to get her to, and we're trying to sort of clarify for her why inequities exist. So she can realize that inequities do not exist because some racial group there's something wrong with some racial group. They, they exist because of these larger policies and powers. And, and, and so that's what we're seeking to do. And, and I think it's a tremendous job as a parent, right? You literally have the opportunity to raise a racist or an anti-racist, and, and we're committed to raising an anti-racist. Well, we have about a minute left, but I wanted to ask you, you, uh, you uh, grew up as a child in the same neighborhood, or roughly the, the same neighborhood as the president of the United States, Queens, New York. <laughs> uh, but obviously, different, uh, different upbringings and different perspectives. And you mentioned that in, in your book. Talk about right, growing up in Queens. Sure. So, yeah, I grew up in Jamaica, Queens, and, and I had—I was fortunate that my parents 
sort of came of age in the black power movement. And, and they specifically the black theology movement, specifically this movement that said, you know what, Jesus is black, he's a reflection of our image, he wears a fro just like we do, and the church needs to be an engine of liberation. Jesus was a revolutionary, and to be like Jesus is to be a revolutionary. And so, in many ways, they never left that type of liberation theology behind and, and raised me to imagine myself as someone who is essentially trying to eliminate racism and really create equal opportunity for all. And what message do you have for President Trump? He probably should read my book. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, I, I don't know whether, obviously, he would. Um, but in more importantly, I would urge his voters to Man, read my book. Could be the first book he's read in years. <laughs> yes. And, no, I was going to say, I, I, I would actually more so urge his voters to, to read my book so they can realize, actually, that his policies are harming them, and the only reason why they're connected to him is because of the racist ideas he manipulates them with. Ibram X. Kendi, author of the new book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. He's speaking in Brooklyn at the community bookstore at Congregation Beth Elohim tonight, a conversation with activist Sean King. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us.